Hello and uh, welcome all to the cosplay workshop section of the Super Sugoi Con. Uh, brought to you obviously by the wonderful people at uh, Super Sugoi. I would like to take this opportunity to thank them for bringing together this incredible uh, con together and with uh, you know such limited resources and availability and uh, you know the kind of the, the complete range of people that we have on board with us today. So. Uh, thank you Rachita san and Izumi san and uh, the rest of your team for all your hard work and uh, yeah and once again thank you for joining me in the workshop uh, my name is Surya I go as uh, Scythe Skunk Works uh, so hopping on to the actual build now understand that uh, cosplay is an art form and how I build my techniques my tips my tools my tricks will work for me it might be something different that you do. I would love to hear about your techniques if you think that you can do something differently. Uh, again, my intent is here to show you the way I work. Uh, again, you are encouraged to try your own methods. But again, we are going to be working with blades and tools. So always, 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 please take care of yourself. Uh, you will see that I will be working with a lot of tools and blades and uh, uh, machine tools, etc. I am aware of what I am doing. You will see that I don't have like gloves on many times but the thing is you can't use certain machines with gloves so again I am aware of the risks involved in such things so please always keep that in mind uh, body parts are not easily replaceable and if you do know where you get them please let me know I would like to give you some point. For this video we'll be making Setsuna's Halbert or Naginata from the series uh, Yashahime which is a spin-off to Inuyasha. Uh, the Halbert is basically a uh, staff but instead of at the end having a pointy stick, it has a pointy blade or a large blade or a, a small, a smallish sword, you can call it that. Now we're going to be making the blade part of it from a foam sandwich and we're going to use a PVC pipe for uh, you know actually making the shaft part of it. And we'll try and build it in such a way that it can be dismantled. As you know, cosplay props can be large and voluminous. So I'll give you some tips on how I would make a prop dismantleable so that you know you can transport it easily. Uh, one of the first things that we need to do when you start building any weapon, prop or cosplay and such is to measure up the person who is going to be actually using the prop and scale it to their size. Like for example the weapon to my size would be 6 foot plus, maybe 7 and a half foot tall. But uh, that's not going to be the case for Serix cosplay. Talking of which, I am at a house going to measure her up today. Yeah, I got the tape ready. Uh, just hear me. Okay. So uh, the weapon is, like the, the shaft of the weapon is still the shoulder height. And uh, it's approximately, what is it, um, 54 inches, right, to the floor, from to her shoulder. But you also want to take into account that she'll be wearing her heels in cosplay. So, why don't you wear your heels? Yes, that needs to be done. Alright, and uh, she's back. And as you can see, she's visibly grown taller. Hmm, secret to becoming tall from Sarah's cosplay. And now, as you can see, if I actually measure her up now, um, uh, she is actually at 58 inches, which is almost a 3.5-4 inch difference in height. So you've got to take that small things into account while you're going to be doing your uh, prop measurements. And obviously the blade is going to be another foot and a half, so uh, it's going to be this big once it's done. So that's almost seven, six and a half feet, I would say. Yeah. Making it long, don't make it heavy. Hmm. Hmm. So we now kind of have the prop size and I, you saw me go to Tanya's place and measure her up and you know, uh, get the sizing done. Chronology of some joke, obviously it was not shot in the same sequence. But yeah, so we have a pipe that we need which is going to be about 58 inches long. So we're going to make a lower pipe about 36 inches and the remaining 22 to 28 inches, uh, sorry, 22, yeah, 22 inches is going to be the stock pipe, right? So that's going to be two pieces of pipe that we have here and we're going to join these two pieces of pipe using a pipe internally. Now what this does is it will give you a very clean fit and you don't need to have like an ugly fitting that is sitting on the outside of your prop or you know you, do, you don't need to like cover this up again with foam or something to bring the level of all your uh, prop to be equal. So it's going to give you a very clean look so we're going to have a little bit of foam detail at the bottom, a little bit of foam detail on the top and we're going to have this wooden strip, we're going to size it in such a way that it fits into this tightly. And once that is fit there, we will fit it onto the top of this. Now, the foam section here is going to be three pieces of foam, which is 10 millimeters each thick. We're going to sandwich it together. The middle layer will have a slot cut into it. The slot will have to be cut very correctly. 
So this fits in very tightly. You don't want it to be you know, moving about in there. Obviously then everything will start moving about. We don't want that. So we want this to be tight. I'll show you how I do that obviously. And we're going to sandwich these three layers. This wooden strip will go into this. This will go into this pipe here. This pipe will obviously be connected to this and this will be connected to this. So you know, the knee bones connected to the thigh bone and blah, 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 blah. Anyway, getting back to it. So we're going to have a very big prop that can be broken down to three pieces, making it easier for transport. So let's get down to it. Start building. So now onto the fun part of the build. Now we're going to start looking at PVC pipes. Now this is your regular uh, gray thin walled PVC pipe which we'll be actually using. This particular pipe is a 3 4 inch, uh, inch internal diameter. I have the pipes almost cut down to size and uh, yeah I'm trying to fit it off screen. I don't know why I'm doing that. Again like I said uh, it's kind of my first video so I will be doing a lot of things which uh, well made sense to me at the time but now they don't. Uh, you will also see that you get a lot of fittings for such pipes. You know, you have like the uh, the L joint there, and that is an example of a T joint. Uh, you will also get end caps for these pipes. Now, these end caps are obviously for sealing the end of the pipes. So that you see now, this is called C PVC pipe. This is a high temperature or resistant pipe, which is used for carrying hot water. So these pipes tend to generally have thicker walls. And if you are planning to do any bending with these pipes, again, would not advise it because these are designed to be heat resistant. What you also do get is a thicker walled pipe. Uh, this is called C PVC pipe, uh, sorry, U PVC pipe. Uh, these are again thick, but uh, they are easy to bend. Now, this is the basic saw that I use for cutting these pipes down. This is available at any hardware store for like 20 bucks. Uh, and uh, if you want to get a little fancy, you do get a pipe cutter. Now, these are a lot more complicated, but yeah, I'll show you how both work. So, this is just me sawing down the pipe. Uh, just to also get it down to size but also to show you basically a technique that I use you rotate the pipe as you keep cutting so that uh, it's easy to line up your cuts and obviously once you're done cutting you need to sand it down as well so that obviously you're going to get a flat uh, finish um, again and most times you'll see me kind of finishing off any cuts that I make with sandpaper because well that's how it should be done uh, you will uh, you know smoothen down all the rough edges and now this is basically, you see, I'm going to use this uh, UPVC pipe here, which is almost the perfect size for the internal three quarters. Again, like there's variation in sizes between manufacturers. So one side is tight and the other side is slightly looser. So I'll just be using, uh, I'll just show you why, why don't you just watch me kind of cut this. So I'm just measuring it about uh, six inches off the pipe so that um, I can cut it with the ratcheting pipe cutting tool. Um, and this pipe cutter here is uh, basically just a ratcheting tool uh, with every click that I make there right now. Uh, the tool kind of closes in on a ratchet or like a gear system and it kind of closes tighter and tighter. It cuts up to 42 millimeter pipe if I'm not mistaken correctly and it's great for doing or cutting thick walled pipes like these. For thinner walls I would recommend using a saw, it's faster. Also would not get crushed by this, uh, you know, pipe cutting uh, instrument that we have here. Now you see that the pipe on one end fits in completely correctly almost perfectly but the other side is still kind of loose so we'll fix that in the next bit. And uh, lo and behold the mighty engineering solution. Basically I'm just applying uh, masking tape over here. Uh, one layer on the side that is kind of tight and uh, three layers on the side that is loose so it kind of just basically solves my uh, the fit issue that we have with one side being tight and one side being loose completely and uh, make sure that the pipe stays kind of jammed together in one piece without any additional support from the outside. So again simple solution. Now for the actual uh, blade itself what I'm doing is I've taken the wooden core that I'll be using for reinforcement the actual piece and uh, traced the shape then I measure the length of the blade that I will be needing. I'll also give myself one inch extra. I'll also make a few parallel lines so that I get references to actually how to make the shape itself. And uh, I personally, when it comes to organic shapes like this, I like to freehand the shape. So you'll see me just making a rough pencil outline. Then I'll follow it up and uh, highlight it or kind of fix the line with a silver pencil in this case because that was the closest pen 
uh, you know pen that I had and once that is done I prefer to cut out these shapes using the same box cutter that I use for cutting my foam pieces you just need to make sure that uh, your blade is sharp and as you can see there is a chef's uh, steel on the top left uh, part of the frame which shows you know again use it regularly just make sure your knives are sharp pro tip right there For actually tracing the pattern onto the foam piece, I am using a cheap 10 rupee glitter pen that you get at every local store there. Uh, you can also use white or glass marking pencils for this purpose. Uh, the pencils turn out to be slightly more expensive than the pens. Uh, they do last a bit longer, but you do need to maintain them and kind of sharpen them as well. Now, as you can see here, I am actually kind of tacking the piece down onto the foam before I trace. This helps so that, uh, you know, the page does not move around as I move the pen about. Again, it's a highly recommended step that you must follow, or I would at least recommend that you do follow it. And uh, there we go. You have your traces done onto the foam. The actual cutting itself. Now, again, before every cut it is recommended that you do sharpen your blade sharp blades will give you cuts that look like laser cuts trust me those are the most fun fun kind to have again i wouldn't recommend i mean like i would not say that you know a chef steel is better than any other kind of sharpener but you do want to sharpen your knives you can also replace the blades in your box cutter or paper cutter uh, those turn out to be expensive so i prefer to kind of use these uh, you know chef's knives sharpeners now here what you can see is you need to make sure that your blade is kept at 90 degrees to the uh, you know the foam that you're cutting so that it does not uh, change the size of the piece you're cutting and again when you're cutting make sure that you are pulling again I prefer so that the foam or the blade is pulled towards me make sure that you're pulling at even pressure and also be very careful of the position of your thumb make sure that your thumb is nowhere near the cutting line Again, I'm being very, very specific here. Make sure that your thumb is nowhere near the cutting line. My hand moves as you will see, but my thumb is kind of away from where the blade's path is. Again, make sure that your cutting is done with a very smooth, slow action so that you know you don't have any unnecessary jerks or any sudden surprises where the blade jumps and you end up injuring yourself. Now here you will see that uh, I am approaching the cut from the other side so just to make sure that I have enough space to hold the foam down again make sure that you feel free enough to kind of you know move this uh, your foam around so that uh, you can uh, you know cut the foam safely again you don't want to be injuring yourself right there and uh, there you go three cuts and uh, you have a foam piece or one of the three the three blade sections ready and uh, you can see the cuts are super clean so we're going to just repeat the process two more times now we have the three pieces already cut and we've also marked which sides are going to be glued. Uh, you would like to do that because again you don't want to have like you know glue spread all over the place and then realize oh no it's got to be glued the other way around. Well trust me it's happened to me a number of times for me to know that. Now here I am placing the reinforcing strip uh, trying to make sure that it's kind of lined up the way I had designed it in my original drawing. And uh, making sure that I do make my lines clean and as straight to the edge as I can. Now make sure that you don't leave too much space here because you want it to be kind of a tight fit. And uh, again, now we'll start down and get down to cutting it. Uh, make sure that you cut on the inside of this line. Uh, here uh, you're seeing that again, same way, uh, slow precise cut. Again, I sharpened my blade before I actually made this cut. Uh, again, slow pull. You can see that this particular piece does not need to move, so my thing, my other hand is kind of far away from the blade tip itself, so again, safety there. Again, my thumb is away from the line of the cut. I'm just making sure that the blade is again at a comfortable angle. Make sure it's 90 degrees, because again, if, you, if your blade here kind of shifts, then, you know, the, the wooden strip will again find it difficult to kind of fit inside this sandwich correctly. So yeah, take your time, make sure that the cut is done correctly, follow the inside of this particular line. Again, just cleaning up your cuts so that uh, the pieces come off clean. Despite that, you will have some instances where uh, there will be bits of foam. I was trimming those foam bits off camera, 
just to make sure that uh, there are no bulges or excess foam lying around. So just checking the fit along with the wooden putty and it seems to be working just fine. And uh, now we're going to start uh, the gluing process. Here you see this is synthetic rubber based adhesive. It's basically what we call as contact cement. And uh, since I already have some stocks of it in tubes, I'm going to just use that. Uh, you do get it in different brands, in different forms as well. Uh, now here I am just marking out the area onto the flat sections where we don't need to actually apply glue. Uh, this is just to save the glue a little bit and also to make your build a little bit cleaner, so to speak. Uh, again, I'm just marking and also what's very very important once again is to again double check the surfaces that you need to glue and uh, set the pairs up correctly. Uh, here you will also need a little bit of scrap foam that you should have from the pieces that you've cut aside and uh, when it comes to contact cement and actually using it, uh, lesser is better as in like you need to have an even surface or an even coat of the of the glue on the foam just make sure it is evenly covered and it's a thin layer it's you don't want lumps you don't want clumps anywhere you don't want like lumpy bits which are not dry when you're actually going to make contact or you know uh, glue the parts together so again make sure that you get the glue in all the corners especially onto the edges on the outside edges which uh, we will be kind of you know sanding and working on later on now if you do miss such areas what happens is uh, the foam normally ends up tearing when you are doing your uh, sanding and shaping and obviously you don't want anything of that sort to happen while you're actually doing uh, your uh, sanding process and you know the shaping so again just make sure that you get all the foam in all the corners and all the edges now we're just going to repeat the process on the other sides as well uh, again making sure that the coat is even it is thin and obviously going to be uh, hitting on all the edges on the sides so just it's a repeat of the same process and uh, when it comes to contact cement once you have applied the cement you got to give it about two to three minutes for it to dry luckily in India we have very dry weather and very warm weather so in such uh, weather uh, the contact cement solvent which is basically what keeps it wet when it's inside the tube or when it's inside the can dries off very very fast so two to three minutes is more than enough now when you are doing the actual gluing as the name suggests contact cement is it immediately joins or makes a bond when it touches so you got to be careful when you're doing your application uh, again just make sure that you line it up correctly and just a little press like that and you should have the pieces uh, glued pretty solidly now here I'm again uh, making sure that the, the wooden putty that I have the reinforcing bit is very solid and when it's glued onto place uh, I have again glued the or applied glued on the other two parts again lining them up carefully um, take your time here at this particular step just make sure that the far end does not touch and just line it up and then just press it gently and even uh, pressure across the entire uh, foam surface and uh, you have a pretty solid bond there that's it so it's stuck up and there's really no need for more gluing uh, just a little bit of test once again with the rod I like to do that just to make sure that the pressure is tight and also I like to get it, you know, it's necessary if you're making a weapon, test it out on something, smack your own hand, make sure it's tough. And, uh, okay, so there's, there we have it, gluing is done. Now here I am uh, taking my pencil and just marking the center line of the prop here, I'm just taking an approximate center of the middle layer of foam. This is just to, as an additional guideline for me so that I can cut the foam to that level on both sides you also see that I've made a center line on the foam itself now here I'm just using a serrated knife again a very cheap serrated knife that you can find in any local shop will do and you can just make this short sawing action that I'm doing here and it will take off large chunks of foam especially if you have a stiff rubber foam it's going to take that off very very easily and it is very helpful when you're doing these large cutting shapes like this so again like you see where my hand is it's again behind where I'm cutting so just keeping the knife and my finger safe and when you come to the tip you can kind of just push the cut all the way through like that and when you cut from the other side as well it will naturally take that shape again uh, I'm keeping it on the table making sure that my fingers are away from where I am cutting uh, or behind the blade as you can see there again safety I'm just going to keep on harping on it because I've seen far too many cosplayers get hurt just before cons and stuff like that 
Now it is a time consuming but you will get your final result which is pretty close to where we need to be at the end of it all. I have gotten the basic shape uh, of the weapon here. It has all the four uh, curves. It is basically a diamond cross section and now what we need to do is basically take some rough sandpaper. Now when it comes to sandpaper the smaller the number the rougher it is so you can do more sanding with it. Now this what I'm using is a old 60 grit uh, belt from my sander machine and you can see it kind of just smooths down those rough edges that we have and um, you just need a little bit of elbow grease if you don't have machines to do this particular section and what I also find is generally at the end of it all even after I do use my machine I will be sanding it with my hand uh, but again I do have a belt sander so <laughs> This is just a quick uh, shot of me actually using the sanding machine. Now this machine basically what it does is it just saves me the elbow grease time and the effort. Um, instead of you you know, using the sandpaper over it for a couple of hours, I can just finish this in about 10 to 15 minutes or probably less than that considering that this is a small blade. So uh, I'm just kind of carefully getting the profile done on the machine. And despite all of that machine work, I'm still going to come back and hand sand it because hand sanding is where you'll actually get your smoothness. I've already gone ahead and finished off with the 80 grit uh, sandpaper. Now what I'm doing here is uh, wrapping uh, 120 grit sandpaper onto a hard surface. Now basically what that allows me to do is it's, it basically, since your hand is flexible, the lines or the curves tend to get a little bit curved. So when you wrap it on a hard surface like that, the handle of my um, knife sharpener that it has over there, it kind of gives you a flat surface. So you are going to do a lot of sanding and dry sanding as well as we'll also be doing some wet sanding where we will kind of, you know, apply a little bit of water and take a higher grit sandpaper here. I'm using 220 grit sandpaper and uh, we're going to be basically doing the whole sanding process again. But with wet sanding what happens is it actually picks up these little small grits that are falling down and uh, does give you a far better finish. and a finish much faster as well so again sanding is kind of important if you want that last bit of extra finish on your prop I would highly recommend that you go ahead and do this process it is tedious but do it and a lot of sanding later we are still out here checking all our surfaces to be smooth and once you're done with sanding you're going to have to do your filler work now here I am using uh, children's uh, super clay foam it's uh, basically a cheap foam that you get it's like 95 rupees for like a packet of 12 and you can obviously you get them in different colors as you can see and i'm just using a random color right there we're going to take a little bit of water as you can see and uh, wet the surface that we are going to stick our uh, clay on just make sure you you must you will actually see these uh, spots and imperfections pop up as you are sanding so you're just going to wet them down a little bit and take a little bit of foam and just kind of wipe the foam as you'll see here. Just take a little bit, pinch it and kind of just wipe it into that little hole or crevice or imperfection. And the, the, the way we press it down, the way the fingers work and the way physics works, it basically is going to take up the space inside those little cracks and imperfections and holes. And it's going to give you a much, much smoother surface. So once you have that going, we're going to have to repeat the whole uh, sanding process again. So it's going to take about three whole cycles like this uh, till we get our final smooth prop. Now, uh, now all the sanding has been kind of completed and we're just going to finish the sizing on the reinforcing wooden putty that we have. Um, we're just taking about six inches, not six inches, about four inches or four five, about five inches, marking it down with a pencil, and we're going to take our trusty little hand saw once again and just chop it down to size. Uh, again, it's not a very expensive tool. You can obviously invest about 25, 30 rupees to get this particular tool for yourself. And uh, as you can see, it does easy work of PVC pipes as we saw earlier on, and also wooden strips like this, which will kind of be a regular feature if you want to make oversized. Uh, foam props I would highly recommend you get yourself one of these little saws here so you can see that I'm sawing hmm wonder what my mind is thinking right now anywho so there we go uh, the piece is cut and we can now just once again check to see if it's fitting and we will also see that it is slightly bigger than the pipe that we have to fit it in so it's not uh, going to fit in that easily and uh, we'll just take it back over to the belt sander and kind of shape it so that it fits in tightly so I will just do that right now off camera 
and uh, here you can see I've kind of just rounded off the edges here on the belt sander and uh, it now fits rather snugly in the pipe so there we have it uh, the, the fitting issue that we have uh, with the pipe and the wooden putty is kind of solved and it's a really nice fit so this is just a mock-up that I have ready and uh, you can see the blade section is now completely good to go and um, yep I'm quite happy with that uh, here you're just seeing a uh, sped up footage of me using my jeweler saw to cut a piece of foam board uh, which will be the final uh, guard that we have again after using the saw I'm just sanding it down using sandpaper you'll find that sandpaper is one of my most favorite tools um, and um, again just testing the fit once again of the guard and uh, I'm quite happy with that so it's good enough for the final fit up and the size is also correct and once all your props are kind of sanded uh, down to size everything else you're going to s seal the surface of the foam with heat now you will notice here that as I use my heat gun on the lower setting and carefully move it across the surface the surface color changes so basically what is happening is those little fuzzy bits of foam that are left behind from the sanding they melt and they kind of form a little hard surface or a little bit of a hard surface so you got to run your heat gun on your foam pieces especially on the areas which are sanded and even on the areas which are not sanded when you have raw foam you can kind of do a little bit of sealing it will make sure that uh, the next step that we have which is going to be basically priming the the piece with uh, fevicol or uh, white glue as it's commonly called uh, will be a little bit faster but then again we've been having really silly weather with the rain so it did not help in the long run so anywho but this is a step that you need to do and uh, highly recommend it is one of the more essential tools as well a heat gun uh, in further videos if I do make them up in the up and coming future we're going to be making some props which will need some bending so we will need a heat gun for that now what I'm doing here is basically again just pressing down the surface it's kind of like uh, just smoothening it out again in case there are any bumps or anything of that sort remaining they do get squished at the last moment so again we're going to do that on both sides and uh, we are ready to fevicol prime now you can use any brand of white glue you can just pick up cheap packets that you find at your local hardware store they will do perfectly fine for our job we are not using it for sticking wooden pieces or making big furniture so that's perfectly fine uh, for the first couple of coats I would recommend that you do mix it one is to one with the water and apply thin coats uh, let it stick let it dry uh, this is one coat done and you're going to do about six coats of it and yes three days later which was quite painful considering the rains once again you're going to finish your priming uh, you'll see that all your parts have this very nice high gloss finish and that's a very good indication that you have a good even coating of uh, fevicol or white glue on all your parts so this is all the parts which have been fevicol primed which is basically sealed uh, you can use plastic dip as well as an alternate but this is a cheap and easy available alternate so let's do that now uh, for metallic paints I would recommend that you use these uh, Camlin acrylic colors they do have a very nice uh, finish and shine as you can see here the gold is really a nice little gold uh, and for diluting acrylic colors I would suggest you use uh, isopropyl alcohol that's also known as surgical spirit it's available at most medical shops and uh, for paint again it's a similar process thin layers uh, evenly coated allow them to dry and then move on to slightly thicker coats of paint and uh, you should have your prop I have skipped over most of the painting process for this prop again like I said not too happy with the way the rains kind of messed about my painting work and uh, here is a completed uh, full-scale picture of the prop fully assembled with relation to my size so here we have uh, the completed halberd prop uh, as you can see it's like one long piece and about six and a half feet tall and it dismantled as planned so I'm just going to take this off here uh, the blade is still a little wet from the oil paint it's been two days it's still not dry uh, I had to use oil paints because I was having trouble with the spray paint silvers and uh, yeah it wasn't just giving me the finish that's because basically it's been raining for the past few days and because of that I've also not been able to get a very good finish on the shaft portion so I'll be doing a repaint of this later on after this video is done so that and also you can see this section again uh, opens up there with the tape and uh, it's kind of holding it tightly 
So I'm just going to do that and you can see it's pretty solid by itself and uh, you can actually just like take this prop apart in seconds and put it together in seconds as well. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed this uh, little video that I put together and uh, do get some help or ideas as to go about making your own prop for yourself. And uh, do let me know if you have any questions or queries in the upcoming Q&A session or even later on when you're actually building your prop. Once again, uh, thank you to the Super Sugoi team, uh, Izumi-san, uh, Rajita-san, uh, for you know giving me this chance to interact with you guys and also to kind of you know push myself to you know my limits and actually make my first uh, how-to tutorial video. Uh, I hope you do enjoy it and take some tips from it. Once again, like I said, and uh, let's go on to the Q&A session then.